Well, welcome once again uh, to the Anglican Future Conference. Uh, it is so great uh, to see you all here. My name is Richard Condy, and I've been chair of the conference committee, and I'll be your host over these next three days. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, everyone who's come together. Uh, we were told this morning by our organisers that uh, we have now 463 registrations for our conference, which is really terrific. As I said before, we come from every state and territory in Australia. Uh, we have uh, 40 of our brothers and sisters from New Zealand. Now you can shout. They're here. Welcome. It's great to have you with us. As you know, this is a joint conference uh, put on by the uh, Australian branch of the Evangelical Fellowship in the Anglican Communion and the Fellowship of Confessing Anglicans in Australia, a new fellowship that will be launched tomorrow night during our conference. I'd like to invite uh, Bishop Stephen Hale uh, to come and greet us. Uh, Stephen is the chair of EFAC Australia. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Thank you Richard. Well, on behalf of EFAC Australia, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this national conference, uh, as well as an international conference as we cross the Tasman. And uh, it's exciting to think that so many people have made the commitment to come and to be a part of this great gathering. Uh, this has indeed, I think, going to be a significant national event, as well as uh, including those who come from New Zealand, and uh, we're very thankful to God for your participation. The last uh, Australia-wide EFAC conference here in Australia was in 2009 here in Melbourne. The last conference of this size, I think, was way back in the, the mid-1980s when the, the second of the NIAC conferences happened, and that was also in Melbourne. Uh, it's great to have uh, such a large contingent here from New Zealand, and we will be united together uh, during these days, but not perhaps on Sunday, uh, depending on what happens today, of course. Um, so uh, we hope it'll be Australia versus New Zealand, and we'll look forward to an interesting outcome on that occasion uh, at a different sanctuary on Sunday. Um, I'd like to welcome the Primate, Archbishop Philip Freer, and thank him for giving up time from his incredibly busy schedule to be with us this morning and uh, speaking to us later on. So let's welcome the Primate. <laughs> And uh, I'd also like to welcome Glenn Davies, who's the president of EFAC Australia. Where's Glenn, Archbishop Glenn Davies? In the, the very far corner over there. Welcome, Glenn. <laughs> We'd like to uh, welcome those who are uh, the heads of EFAC branches across Australia, and they are really the engine room of EFAC. EFAC's a fellowship of evangelical Anglicans. It's true to say that it's kind of his strongest in the places where evangelicals are in a minority, and they therefore... Uh, seek to fellowship and support and encourage each other together, uh, but we do come together nationally and uh, represent the strength and breadth of that across this country. Now, it's true to say that Australia is a very large country. We don't get together very much because of the size and the cost and the constraints of coming together, but it's exciting to know that we have people here who have come from the length and breadth of this land, uh, as well as our friends from across the ditch, and uh, it's going to be great to be able to share together in fellowship and friendship but as well as that, to renew our commitment to serving God in and through the Anglican Church. Uh, and because these are days of great opportunities, I'm an optimist. Uh, and I think if we come together in a spirit of fellowship and uh, commitment to Christ and a commitment to the gospel, then we uh, can participate in great things in the future together. And hopefully this conference will be an insight into some of what that potential future might look like. So welcome and thank you for coming and participating. Uh, the idea of this conference came about when a few of us were uh, contemplating the health of the Anglican Church of Australia. Uh, as we look around the country, we see uh, lots of life and vitality, growing congregations and some church planting and uh, healthy finances and people coming to faith in Christ. Uh, but also there are other places, sometimes in the same diocese, where it's quite a different story. Declining numbers and vitality, people doing it tough, the loss of confidence in the gospel and churches even closing. Uh, that general impression was underlined when we met for the General Synod uh, last year uh, in Adelaide. Uh, we released a report there on the vitality of, uh, the, and the viability of the Anglican Church in Australia, and it's a very sober read. If you haven't read it, uh, you should. Uh, the overall state of our church as we uh, face significant challenges. And talking uh, with our New Zealand brothers and sisters, it seems like things are also not in great shape across the Tasman. 
So rather than sit back and lament this and just hope that things would get better, uh, we thought that we should take some positive steps. Uh, God hasn't finished uh, with his church. And uh, this conference is designed to stimulate growth and to think about the challenges before us of how we make a positive contribution for the future. You'll notice several themes uh, in the conference. Uh, each day we're going to be hearing from God's word. We're going to, uh, Kanishka Rafael is going to come and uh, bring us uh, the first Bible study this morning from 2 Peter. We're going to hear what God has to say to us about the state of our church. Uh, each day we'll also explore an aspect of Anglican theological identity and we're very pleased to have uh, Dr Ashley Null with us to talk about scripture and salvation and worship over our, over our three days. And then we're going to be exploring three themes, one each day. Today, our missionary context. Uh, who, who are the people we're trying to reach? Uh, tomorrow, issues for the church. And Friday, imagining our Anglican future. Our hope is that this conference will bless the church. A couple of housekeeping things before I uh, welcome uh, some of our other guests. Uh, you will have uh, received a, a conference bag on your, uh, on your seat this morning. We tried to put them all down the front so that you would sit there and not be Anglican, sit up the back. And I see you've been very Anglican, come down and pick them up from the front and taking them up the back. We're very happy about that. Uh, and uh, uh, if you've got... Uh, 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 questions or you're not sure what's happening, there will always be somebody at the registration desk uh, that you passed when you came uh, in this morning in the foyer, so please go there. Uh, also in the foyer are the tables uh, and displays of our sponsors who have very generously uh, sponsored the conference. Uh, please visit them uh, and, uh, and make use of the things that they have available for you, including the bookshop uh, in the foyer. Uh, in the conference uh, bag, you have this very uh, splendid notebook. Please uh, use it. Lots of other goodies, including a gift uh, from the organisers. Uh, the toilets, if you need them, are at the back of the auditorium on my left. Uh, so if you just head up there, you'll uh, find uh, your way uh, to the toilets. We welcome you to have your mobile phones, but please uh, leave them on silent. Uh, it would be great uh, for those who want to tweet or post on Facebook. Facebook or blog uh, during the conference. The hashtag is on the screen behind me, A Future 15 uh, is what it is, and we'd love uh, for you to be uh, using social media during the conference. Uh, as you know, there are no meals provided during the conference, but above and around us here are a number of places that you can enjoy uh, Melbourne's culinary delights. Uh, you would have, uh, I hope, received a coffee card. Uh, this is a single use. Uh, we want you to enjoy Melbourne coffee when you're here. It will give you a coffee uh, at four different locations around us here, and you can use it any time in the next three days. Uh, uh, so please uh, make sure that you get one of those, and, uh, and that will get you started on Melbourne coffee, and you will never stop. <laughs> uh, we are most uh, honoured today to have uh, two guests uh, from the International uh, uh, Fellowship of Confessing Anglicans movement, uh, the GAFCON movement, and I would like especially to welcome the Most Reverend Eliud Wabukala, uh, who is uh, the, who is the uh, primate of Kenya and the chairman of the GAFCON Primates Council, and his wife, Mrs. Uh, Rhoda Wabukala. Uh, welcome uh, to you both. Would you please welcome them here? We're so uh, delighted that they've come. They flew in last night, so if they're looking a little weary by this afternoon, you'll understand why. Uh, and uh, we're also very honoured to have the Most Reverend uh, Stanley Intagali, uh, the Primate of Uganda and a member of the GAFCON Primates Council, uh, who is here. Uh, it is uh, wonderful to have uh, you with us, and uh, I understand Mrs Ntagali will be uh, here uh, later uh, in the conference as well. And as Stephen said, we're also very honoured to have uh, the Primate of the Anglican Church of Australia here, uh, the Most Reverend Dr Philip Freer, who is Archbishop of Melbourne. He's going to open our conference uh, with an address uh, called Anglican Future, Our Hope in Christ. Uh, would you please welcome Archbishop Philip. <laughs> I'd like to firstly acknowledge that we meet on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and in this context pay particular thanks to the Christian missionaries who uh, in much suffering and uh, many challenges, especially from those who, of whose culture they shared, reached out to take the gospel to indigenous people in Australia and ameliorate uh, the suffering which was uh, profound and uh, continues today 
uh, that resulted from colonialisation. Well, welcome to Melbourne, especially for those of you who are visitors from other parts of Victoria, from other states and territories, and other countries. The Diocese of Melbourne has a vision to make the word of God fully known, taken from Colossians 1.25. And we've responded to that vision by making specific goals in parish renewal, church planting, theological education, and in multicultural ministry. We believe as a diocese that God has a purpose for the Anglican Church of Australia and the wider Anglican Communion, and equips us with the gifts and grace to face the many challenges that confront us. In a world where so many things are contingent upon another, we are called as Christian believers to understand that the new life we have in Christ is contingent on no earthly thing, but only on God's free gift of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. No sociological argument or explanation can ever satisfactorily plumb the depths of this truth. And no psychological insight reaches to the same vulnerability of the human soul. Nor can any political ideology ever offer the dignity that is ours in Christ. I say this because we are immersed in a world where there are many explanations for many things, including faith and religion. We're all a walking and talking construct of these many ideas. They practically shape our thoughts and actions, yet they can never by themselves make meaning apart from divine revelation of what God did for the world in Christ. Our future, the world's future, is either disclosed in the incarnation, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, or it is not. For Christians, this truth must become the reality which frames our understanding of daily life. Without our growing constancy of discipleship, we are easily led into many apparently satisfying ideas, but ones which may not ultimately be informed by the mind of Christ. And let me return to that assertion that either the world has its future in Christ or it does not. The long history of Christian reception of divine revelation is that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel, as foretold by the prophets, the one who fulfills the law's requirements in his own body, and through his death on the cross, opens the way for humans to have a restored relationship with God the Father and creator of all. Faith in Christ and his identity as the Messiah of Israel and his personhood in the undivided Trinity is the means through which God's free gift of salvation is appropriated by a fallen humanity. The same Christ is present at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us and is the one who is the world's and all humanity's true measure and we were revealed as such on the last day as he judges the living and the dead. These events, revealed in Christ's own person, are then the true data about eternal realities which God seeks to frame and guide our understanding. They are reality-shaping truths through which the world is changed, renewed, and restored. If we have failed to learn about the predicament of humanity without Christ from the blood-soaked history of the 20th century, this first decade and a half of the 21st century has given us ample reason to understand why the Father has intervened in human affairs to effect salvation through his Son. At this very moment, we have relentless aggression taking place against Christians who, along with other minorities, are declared to have no place in the new world order that the utopian zealots of IS seek to establish in Syria and Iraq and any other territory that can fall under their influence. Even here, in the worst of this brutal inhumanity, the gospel good news that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost is either true or it is not. The execution of the Christian martyrs of Syria was boastfully proclaimed in a graphic video entitled, A Message signed with blood to the nation of the cross. And I suspect that these terrorists could not have known how this morbid parody stated a central truth of Christianity. That is, the redemptive death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. The cross carries a message signed with blood that frees all who accept it by faith in Christ from sin and the power of death. And I take strength from the witness of these Coptic martyrs 
and the faithful of every age as I make a daily intention to contend for the truth of Christ's revelation in my own context. How could the struggles we face seem to add to much discouragement compared to the witness of those who have been faithful unto death? Just as the martyrs cry from under the altar in Revelation 6.10, Sovereign Lord, how holy, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge and avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? It remains in the keeping of God when justice will find its measure of human evil and sin. No wonder St. Paul concludes his first letter to the Corinthians with a plea for the Lord to come. For where else could our help arise? Having a future in Christ calls from us faithfulness and reliance on him through the Holy Spirit in good times and in bad. The content of the Catholic and apostolic faith must, of course, be the reality that stands above our own particular cultural receptions of faith. As beautiful and persuasive as our culture is, it must be transformed by Christ. Otherwise, we easily find ourselves in the predicament of Protestantism in pre-Second War, World War America, which H. Richard Niebuhr caricatured as having conveyed a message that, in his words, a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. Instead of our culture shaping us into the proponents of some deconstructed and privatized shadow of Orthodox and Catholic Christianity, we must instead have the clear focus on calling people to life in Christ, incorporating them as fellow disciples in the church, and be on tent in manifesting the love of Christ both inside and outside the church. Another American, the Lutheran theologian Robert Jensen, wrote as recently as 2010, in response to the crises of the second century, the church received a trio of institutions to guard its identity through time, canon, creed, and episcopate. And I'm glad to be the primate of a church which is constitutionally bound to these three safeguards. Summarizing the first paragraphs of the constitution of the Anglican Church in Australia, how good that we strive to receive the faith of the primitive church as confessed in the creeds. How true to the apostles that we receive the canonical scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as the ultimate rule and standard of faith. And how apposite that we profess obedience to the commands of Christ as we teach his doctrine and administer the sacraments of the new covenant. Uphold his discipline and receive the orders of bishop, priest, and deacon in the sacred ministry. Uh, time prevents me from expanding on the cultural and theological waves that seek to erode these pillars of apostolic faith and order. But suffice it to say that we need to be alert on many sides to the temptations of shaping the faith that we have received to our own liking and preference. And I pray that you will have an encounter of real love and peace in Christ during your time of meeting here in Melbourne. And I also ask you to weigh within your hearts each day the cost of discipleship, which our Lord tells us involves daily denial of self and bearing the cross. And so I close with this prayer of blessing from the Book of Common Prayer of what was then the Church of India, Pakistan, Burma, and Ceylon. May the cross of the Son of God, which is mightier than all the hosts of Satan and more glorious than all of the hosts of heaven, <laughs> Abide with you in your going out and your coming in. By day and night, at morning and at evening, at all times and in all places, may it protect and defend you from the wrath of evildoers, from the assaults of evil spirits, from foes visible and invisible, from the snares of the devil, from all passions that beguile the soul and body. May it guard, protect, and deliver you. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop. Would you stand as we sing again?